Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. We are here today with a friend of the channel, Crisper Hassan. He has a great YouTube channel. It is in the description. I'm putting his Twitter in the chat right now. And uh, Hassan specializes in talking a lot about the CRISPR world, CRISPR therapeutics, genomics, ArcG, one of the bigger funds that's out there around this topic. And uh, today I wanted him to give a little bit of a high level overview on what is the world of genomics? What is the world of CRISPR? Why should investors be excited about this? And, you know, in the next 10 years, a lot of people are talking about AI. This is a industry that has the potential to, you know, people are saying AI is going to create trillions of dollars of value. We have no idea how many trillions could potentially be created in the nature of genomics and CRISPR therapeutics. So super, super exciting stuff. Hassan, can you tell us who you are and uh, why you're so interested in this and why do you even have a channel about this stuff? Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Amit. Um, so, I started my YouTube channel, uh, let's say about three years ago now. It's probably about almost three years ago. And I, I didn't have any like CRISPR background and we'll, we'll get into what CRISPR is and so on, but I didn't have any biotech background. I mean, I, I'm more of an electrical engineer. I actually work in, in a software industry. Um, obviously I've been involved with, you know, stock, the stock markets for many years before I got involved with CRISPR. So, um, so the way I, I would do it, I would study, I would research the field that I'm interested in is obviously I would go on YouTube first, right? And I would go, I would go, I would go on YouTube, I would study it, I would look at the company, whether that's Tesla, for example, I was obviously one of the investors before Tesla blew up in 2020. Uh, I would YouTube it, I would look at what, you know, at the time it was called Twitter, what Twitter folks would say is uh, on Reddit. Um, so same thing with every other company that I've invested in, right? You do your own research, you build your conviction and so on. So what's interesting is when I got to CRISPR, that was about 2020, 2019, the holidays, early 2020. Uh, it, it, it was actually interesting because I started doing my research. And the first thing I noticed is there were like four videos on YouTube about CRISPR. Right, right, and there was like one YouTuber, and his name actually is uh, CRISPR Tommy. And unfortunately, he doesn't really make videos anymore. But uh, it was like one YouTuber, right? And you had right. those couple of uh, videos on YouTube talking about uh, some random like information on just the stock price itself. Nothing really substantial about the companies, about the technology. And I took it on my upon myself. I said, you know what? Let me make a channel on this. Let me just make videos and let's see what happens. And Again, it's been over almost three years now. Uh, the channel just has over 2,000 some subscribers. It's grown really slow, but uh, but there's obviously a lot of people interested in this space. Actually, we, we're like this community of folks in the CRISPR landscape. And it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, you would think that we're talking about companies and we do talk about those companies. We do talk about obviously, uh, you know, the stocks behind it and everything, but there's actually a huge portion of the community is more interested in the technology itself. Right. Um, and obviously we can get, go in depth with that. So that's how I got started more or less. Uh, okay. So let's get into it. Um, g give me, a, 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 as if I'm in fifth grade, because all of us really need to try to understand this at a baseline level. What is the, uh, investment thesis around investing in CRISPR stocks? You've got genomic stocks like Ginkgo Bioworks. That's the one I'm the most familiar with. And you, then you've got a ton of uh, stocks in ArcG and we'll talk about ArcG later, but why would an investor, when they could invest in FANG, they can invest in Bitcoin, they can invest in Tesla, like if they had to have an opportunity cost of where their capital goes, why would this be an area that they would be excited for about? Right, right. So first of all, those those assets you just mentioned, whether that's uh, Bitcoin or Tesla, I'm actually invested in those as well. So it's not like, uh, I mean, those are amazing assets. Um, the reason why specifically CRISPR, I mean, there is the genomics, which obviously, you know, ARC, uh, um, ARC, um, ARK Invest there, they, they, they talk about the genomics fund and so on. Their genomics is like a big bubble with a bunch of biotech companies. Uh, but obviously, there's a small segment of those uh, that are for CRISPR, right? And the reason why I think, and again, this is not financial advice. So, um, you know, this is just educational information on my end. Um, the reason why these CRISPR companies, in my opinion, they're undervalued is because there's such a huge market for curing diseases. And that's what these companies are doing, right? These companies are curing human disease. And you got to think this through, right? Never in the history, like think about this, right? Every technologies that we've evolved, 
throughout human history, there have been amazing technologies, right? You think about like, the printer, you know, printing books, you think, think about electricity, light bulbs, you think about the airplanes, you think about cars going from horses to cars. All of those technologies were amazing and obviously have done really well over time. But there's one thing we were never able to do, and that is to edit the human genome. Right. You're we never able to do that. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of us, unfortunately, don't have the right genes. For example, some of us, unfortunately, we have maybe diseases, rare diseases, and obviously some are more serious than others. Uh, there are some diseases out there that are literally uh, taking people's lives by the age of 30, 40, 50, like sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. And unfortunately, we've never had a technology up until basically now that's able to tackle some of those diseases like CRISPR um, therapeutics is doing with sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. And, and basically what I'm getting at is there's a huge market for this, obviously. Like, I, I don't even think, when you think about it, and I understand people talk, think about AI and everything, but what is more precious in life than extending your lifespan? Like, right. Because that's what it is, right? Like extending lifespan of a human being. Like basically, if you're, if you have one of those rare diseases, like sickle cell disease, and in the UK, for example, the median age is about 50 years old, so of lifespan. So which means by the age of 50, you're pretty much unfortunately dead if you have sickle cell disease. And there were there were literally no cure for it. There's no cure. Like there's no like a pill that you can take. There's nothing. And you're stuck with that. And that's a genetics thing. And basically up until obviously in November when the UK approved CRISPR therapeutics program, we finally now have for the first time ever a cure for that specific disease, which basically now people can live with those diseases can live longer than 50 years old, for example. So now they can go on to live 70, 80, whatever years old. So what like that's that's basically the thesis behind it, right? You have these companies curing diseases that can extend the lifespan of human beings and there is no cure for these diseases. Like it's not like there's something you can just go to the pharmacy and just take a pill and you're good. Like it doesn't work like that. Those those diseases that those CRISPR companies are tackling, there's like these are lethal diseases. These are uh, diseases that put you like in hospital beds for like years, right? This is not something that's uh, you can just live a normal life, right? This is uh, it, it's a it's a big thing. Like I said, um, we have amazing companies out there outside of CRISPR, like in software in the software world we have amazing companies doing amazing things in in the world but there's really no companies out there that can really compete with what these companies are doing in this space when it comes to like what are we doing for human health right and that that's what the crispr <clears throat> play is um notice that i didn't talk about like editing your brown eyes into blue eyes or making your kid taller i didn't even talk about that because Although that's a promise a lot of people, a small amount of people are talking about with the CRISPR future. I'm not even worried about that. I'm more worried about the human therapeutic side of things and maybe even the uh, agriculture side of things, which we can jump on. So you think about climate change, you talk, think about food shortages, uh, you think about everything that we can do to basically reduce poverty, increase nutrition for individuals around the world, not just in developed worlds, but obviously in um, less developed regions around the world. So that's another side of CRISPR that I'm really bullish on, but it's really two sides, right? The human therapeutics and the vegetation side of things. Um, that's basically what it is in a nutshell. And so your overall like investment thesis is that there are these diseases that we have to try to cure and CRISPR gives us a foundational understanding of how we can create a framework to facilitate the potential cure for them. Uh, one quick question before we get into the specifics, like, if that 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 you have to approach that with a long term investment mindset, right? Because curing diseases, there's a lot of trial and error before something works. But if it does work, obviously there's a massive potential there. Yeah, I mean it's definitely long term, right? Uh, if if well, one of the things I said, actually my first video on YouTube, literally I said, uh, if you're in this space for like the next year, and that was in twenty, what is it, 2020, 2021, I said if you're in this space for just one year or two years. You're in the wrong space. This thing takes, like this space, it takes time, right? Just to give a little bit of perspective for viewers that are not familiar with the FDA, which obviously in the US is the regulatory body there uh, for any medicine and therapies. The FDA, the average time that it takes to get your 
whatever you're trying to do, right? Your therapy, your medicine, whatever, it's about 10 plus years, right? Think about it. For the moment that you start your company, you start an idea, and the moment that it gets FDA approved, the average time that whatever this therapy, this medicine is, is about 10 years. Right. So just based on that, right? Like just to give a little bit of timeline, we knew about CRISPR-Cas9, which again, I'm getting in, in a bit in the weeds here, but just to give a timeline for folks, in 2013, we had the first human cell be edited with CRISPR-Cas9 in 2013. It's 2024, and finally, we have a CRISPR-based therapy available in the U.S. That's basically 10 years later, right? Just think about that time frame, right? Obviously, now things have started accelerating after the recent news of the FDA, uh, which we're going to get into, but um, but you're definitely in this space for a long time. <laughs> right, right. No, it, it's very exciting, and I think you know you got to be a long-term investor when it comes to this stuff because... The short-term volatility of this can be massive, but it's like you can't imagine, you know, oh, is Google's, you know, free cash flow going to decline? It's like, that, dude, it's like, this is like, they're going to fail a lot. And if they come to some type of conclusion, then they win. Okay, so let's talk about the human therapeutics, then we'll get to vegetation. So talk to me a little bit about uh, CRISPR, I think the company and the developments that have happened in December that are making you very bullish on human diseases potentially having a better chance to be solved. Yeah, so basically... Um, in November of 2023, uh, early November, for the first time ever, a country approved a CRISPR-based therapy, specifically the CRISPR therapeutics program, which is shared with Vertex. A lot of folks are aware of Vertex, which is a big pharma company. Um, it was officially approved in the early November of 2023 for sickle cell disease. And that was the first time ever that it was a country uh, approved CRISPR, uh, like a therapy from CRISPR, which means basically CRISPR therapeutics and Vertex can sell their therapy in the UK, right? So that happened in the first part of November. Just about two weeks later, Bahrain, which is obviously a country in the Middle East, approved the same exact program in Bahrain for CRISPR, uh, for sorry, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, which are the two diseases that that program is tackling the, the two rare blood disorders. And then officially, and, and, and don't get me wrong, those were big news, right? The first, obviously UK is a big country. I don't, I don't need to explain how important the UK is for the world, right? Um, and the Bahrain obviously is a smaller country, but it's a big player in the Middle East. That was a great news. But everybody really had their eyes on the FDA, right? Because everything that the FDA does every other country follows. I can speak as right. a Canadian based in Canada. I can say this, whatever the FDA does, Health Canada, which is our own regulatory body, follows it. And if anybody wants a proof of that, just go back in the pandemic. Uh, everything that the FDA does, countries follow. So everybody had their eyes on the FDA, whether they would approve it or, or reject it. And we knew that the FDA was supposed to either approve or reject it by December 8th of 2023. Right. Now, there are some couple of things leading up to that moment, which I, I don't want to get too much in the, in the details there. But the point here is that on December 8, the FDA officially announced that they are approving CRISPR therapeutics and Vertex program, which is called CASJAVI, wow. uh, formerly known as XSL and formerly, formerly known as CTX001, um, to tackle sickle cell disease. Beta thalassemia, which is another blood disorder that the same program is tackling, that's set for 2024 March. Some I forgot the exact date, but in the less two less than two months, the FDA has to reject or approve for that specific disease, which we have all reasons to believe um, that they will also approve it. So basically, what I'm getting at is when the FDA approved that program, that changed everything because. Now for the first time ever, and 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 we, we'll go into details there, but for the first time ever, now we have CRISPR available for commercial. Basically, Vertex, which owns 60% of that program, 40% is owned by CRISPR Therapeutics, they can basically sell their therapy at $2.2 .2 million, which is actually the figure that they gave uh, around December as well. Right. So basically at $2.2 .2 million a therapy, um, and there's about, and then this, these are early statistics, um, but uh, Dr. Sam, which is um, the CEO, 
and uh, of uh, CRISPR therapeutics said that at the first year they expect about thousand patients. If you do the basic math, that's thousand times two point two millions. That's about the revenue that they could be generating. Who's Obviously, paying the two point two million? The that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, there's no way a uh, this citizen can be expected to pay that. Actually, there's absolutely no way. Um, so there's it's going to be a collaboration between the government and uh, your insurance. Again, I don't fully understand. In the U.S., there are some things. Uh, there's some things. Uh, I think it's between states and so on. Again, I am Canadian, so I don't know f- the full details. I will say one thing though. Uh, right after that, um, actually this week, I made a video on it. The Saudis approved CRISPR, basically approved the program. Right. The Saudis now, and I know this for a fact, the Saudis, they fully pay it for uh, their patients, right? That's the patient's not paying a single cent. So now you have basically four official countries that have approved a CRISPR-based therapy. Uh, the UK first, then Bahrain, then of course the US, and of course, finally, uh, Saudi Arabia there and that's that's pretty groundbreaking when you think about where we came from and all the way now. I think a lot of people in our channels like still a little bit star truck stars starstruck from everything that happened. A little bit like it's it's sometimes hard to believe because this has been years in playing, right? This has been years. Um, a lot of like myself, like I I was in, even in 2022 and 2023 during a little bit of dark times here in the markets. Um, sometimes it it didn't look like there'll be a light in the tunnel right at the end of the tunnel so um this is big this is big and uh um but yeah the it's 2.2 million dollars obviously it's a lot of money and there's no way the patients can pay that out of their pocket that's why you have for example uh in the uk there's this their healthcare system that covers it with insurance there's a bunch of stuff going on there the saudis i know this for a fact they cover everything Uh, that's the oil money but um, so that's that. And then, uh, Bahrain, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. Uh, I don't know about the U S though. I, I probably should, I was, I was hoping to do some research on this because it requires me to understand a little bit of how healthcare works and everything. And unfortunately I, I didn't really have the time for that, but I'll get there. How, what was the catalyst for them to approve it in November? Was it like a new, um, something happened like in the research that proved that it's finally healthy enough to, yeah. Approve? Yeah. So that's a great question. So you, you got to remember, right, these diseases, like, for example, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia in the UK, for example, the median age, and they published that, the UK government, the median age for survival is 50 and 40 years old, uh, respectively, which means by, if you have beta thalassemia, and you're, you're pretty much gone by the age of 40, um, which is pretty bad when we think about it, right? And there's no cure, there's nothing, right? And then for the first time ever, we have data from CTX001, the program that was formerly known as, and then renamed to XSL and now obviously to CASGEVI, that program had amazing data, right? I, you got to remember, right? These programs, they don't just like dose people randomly. Like these are really strict, regulated. Like there's a lot of regu- reg- um, regulations in this market. Like that. that's what a lot it scares a lot of investors is the regulations and you know, the policies that you have to go through, all the bureaucracy and so on. I mean, forget about the FDA. The FDA is actually one of the better ones. Like there's other countries out there that it's really hard to start a clinical trial and so on. Um, That's why I gave you the figure about 10 years. And that's in the FDA side of things, right? Um, The 10 years where the moment you start your documentation and so on, all the way to approval. Um, And to basically answer your question directly, it's because we had amazing data, right? 97% of patients in the CRISPR therapeutics program basically were quote unquote cured. And I'm putting quote, uh, cure in quotes because apparently you're not allowed to say cured. Right. Um, you're not allowed to say cured. You have to monitor the patients over the years. But I, I mean, data shows that everything's going, going really well for those patients. I actually have one of the patients in my YouTube channel. Um, Jimmy, I forgot his family name, uh, Jimmy something. He's, uh, I, I had an interview with him. Obviously, he was limited with what he could say because he was still obviously enrolled in that program. Um, but it changed his life. Right. It's, it completely changed his life. He told me straight up. He told me I went from, you know, not being productive, being always tired, fatigued, all this like time spent in hospitals uh, and not knowing how long I live to basically be on, being cur- uh, quote unquote cured. Um, so that's basically why 
the UK basically was approved it. That's why the FDA had to approve it. Like there's, you know, at some point you got to ask yourself, you know, what, what is your purpose for the FDA, right? What is your purpose like to, to even exist is to right. protect your citizens. Right. Right. Um, and if you're not going to approve a program because the technology is, is like new or still unknown, but you got, you got patients dying, you know what I mean? You, you got to take a decision at some point. Right. So. Right. Ian says CRISPR approval in the UK recognizes Oxford and Cambridge universities are both supporting advancement in global health research. And they both like CRISPR as well. Uh, and rock and Ronnie says, I like Hassan's accent. I like it. Too. Yeah. That's a, a French accent. Uh, yeah. It's a French accent. Um, cause I'm originally from Montreal, obviously now I'm based in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a French accent mixed with English and mixed with the uh, Urdu from my parents. So I love it. I love it. Um, okay. Vegetation side. What is the TAM for CRISPR therapeutics to, I guess, in a nutshell, solve climate change, mitigate the effects of climate change? Yeah. So th the reason why I, I first started with human therapeutics is because if, first of all, you know, every organization, uh, has a mission statement, right? And CRISPR therapeutics mission statement is for human therapeutics. There's no vegetation in there. Maybe that's going to change in the future. Who knows? Um, but for now, some of these companies are specifically focused on the human side of things. There's only one company in the CRISPR landscape that I know of that is actually involved in the vegetation side of things. Uh, and that's Calibu Biosciences, uh, stock uh, ticker CRBU. And basically, the play here for vegetation, I mean, it's pretty, it sounds pretty straightforward, but I don't think people really wrap their heads around it. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Actually, there's right now, you can Google that, like as I'm speaking, mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of crops around the world that actually uses CRISPR. Uh, I know in the Florida, they did something in Florida. I know um, there are a couple of tomatoes there, the plantations. I, I don't remember corn, exactly. wheat, rice, and sugarcane. A lot of these are using CRISPR. Right. So you may ask, well, what's the point of using CRISPR on food? Well, think about this way, right? And again, I'm, I'm not an expert in agriculture, but I think it's common sense that climate change is here. Uh, I think it's common sense to believe that we, we saw a bunch of shortages. We saw uh, because of the environment, some crops they go bad. There's viruses that spread out between foods and they become bad. So basically you have a bunch of wasted uh, food that otherwise you could be nourishing people. Um, and CRISPR does exactly fix that problem. CRISPR actually, just like how we can cure the human from a disease, you can actually cure the plant from its disease and make it live longer and make it more nutritious, right? So you got to think it that way, right? Again, there's no, if you're looking for, okay, well, give me the company, give me the total addressable market. I don't really think we're there yet with CRISPR. Um, based on my research, anyways, I think the the folks that are working with the vegetation side of things is more like private companies and uh, local uh, universities and so on. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, but who knows? After this news with the FDA, things can go faster. But like I said, there's a bunch of crops out there that are using CRISPR. This is nothing new. I mean, there, you could. This has been quite a few years now. Um, I would love that. This is one of my predictions, and and I know. We're not really, you know, there's so much to talk about with the human side of things. But one of my predictions is these companies are going to evolve beyond human therapeutics. I think they're going to evolve to vegetation. I think that's something that I've uh, predicted a couple of years ago. I think one of my videos on my channel, I talked about that. I talked about how there is a play for like CRISPR therapeutics, for example. And again, you got to remember, right, their talent is limited, their resources are limited. They have to focus on what they're best at, which right now is human therapeutics, that cash Javi program. They got other programs in the pipeline, which we may want to talk about. Um, but I predict that these companies are also going to tackle vegetation somehow, some way, make profits out of it. Uh, I don't know if the full numbers, I haven't really studied it to that extent, but um, but for sure, if someone is interested um to look into that, there's a bunch of research papers that shows the potential of CRISPR, not just on human therapeutics, but on vegetation. And you got to remember, vegetation is not just food. It's also like oil. It's also energy. There's a right. bunch of things in there. I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds there, but uh, there's a lot of things uh, that CRISPR can do beyond, in my opinion, the most important thing, which is curing human diseases. There's other things too, like you know, making sure that your tomatoes 
don't die out, right? Making and, and, sure and you think that with, yeah. with uh, I know we have a little bit of a, I guess a population crisis in terms of people not wanting to have that many babies, but let's say in the next 50 years, we do get to, I don't know where we're at, 8 billion. Let's say we do get to 11 or 12 billion. Uh, you, we are going to need some level of technology to not only produce food, but preserve food because we just got to feed more people on the planet. Yeah. I mean, the, um, I, I think CRISPR can definitely help that. I, I just think, like, you got to remember, CRISPR is one of many tools, right? The way I see this is CRISPR is a technology, it's a tool. But it's not like that alone will solve many problems. Like, even with human therapeutics, CRISPR alone cannot solve every single problem. There's actually other things involved. There's other technologies that we actually need to evolve, to develop, in order to solve most problems in a particular space. So vegetation side of things, I mean, there's a, a, a lot of other things there, right? CRISPR, I think, can help. I definitely think it can help. I think it can definitely do more than good than bad, obviously. Uh, and it's already been, like I said, there's a bunch of crops using CRISPR as we speak. Um, I just don't think it's, uh, I, I think a lot of people are more focused on the human side of things only because it's like, uh, I think the, 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 the money is right, right there, right? Think about right. Think about how many nations around the world would be willing to get their hands on a program like Castravi, which you got to remember there's 100,000, I think, I think that's the figure, 100,000 Americans that have sickle cell disease. And just a note for your viewers, just because you cure them from sickle cell disease, just because you cure them from sickle cell disease does not mean that their children gets cured, right? Let's say you don't have kids, you're cured from sickle cell disease. We don't, that does not edit their germline. Right. So, so uh, what I'm trying to explain here is there's always going to be people out there with uh, diseases, unfortunately, uh, which means a lot of money for these companies, right? Uh, which is a good thing uh, because you need money to survive, right? For these companies. I agree. Ibot says, let me make this easier. Plants can be made to disease resistant and more climate tolerant. Crop yield can be improved. Plants can be drought tolerant. There's just so many things that can happen, obviously. And yep. all those different things are very, very exciting as well. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions about the company. So management of CRISPR, are these the right guys to be putting our money into to do this? Yeah, so that's a good question. So again, uh, if we're talking about CRISPR therapeutics, the, the big company in this space, really the people that mostly known if they know CRISPR, they probably know this company it's CRISPR therapeutics a stock uh, ticker is crsp uh the leadership in my opinion uh from everything i've seen everything i've uh, reviewed and this this has been going for over three years now um uh, their ceo is you know in my opinion stellar i think he's one of the top ceos in the biotech market uh he every interview that i've seen him go through he's very um professional he uh, he makes he made a couple of bullish statements early on. I think he's sort of backtrack on those, um, but he's always been very positive. He's always like the positive outlook, even during the dark times of CRISPR of 2022 and 2023, when those stocks were uh, you know declining at a very fast pace from their 2021 peak. Um, I mean, management side of things, it's it's a little bit hard sometimes to look at these this um, from the company standpoint because you know you. Well, up until now, you at the, before November, really, you didn't really have a commercial available product. So everything was like clinical trials, right? And again, you could look at data, but just because you have amazing data does not mean you have amazing management, right? Um, and just a note on that, I mean, there are some companies in the CRISPR landscape that I could tell you right now, that's a huge red flag with management, right? Um, for example, let's just give out the name. One of the older, older, older companies in the landscape. Uh, Editas. Uh, right. So this this company, you know, they they're one of the older public companies of the CRISPR companies out there. Yet they're so far behind with their clinical trials. They've changed CEOs like four times in the three times in the last four years, or something crazy like that. Right. Um, so there's some bad management for sure. Um, but I do want to make another point too. I mean, you gotta you gotta recognize that, for example, CRISPR therapeutics. I mean, they sold 60% of that program to Vertex. Vertex basically paid over $2 billion for that program. 
Right. You're not paying $2 billion without doing your due diligence, right? Yeah, you know, some people need to uh, look at, you know, these companies, big pharma companies investing in these companies. I mean, let's be honest, right? They obviously did their due diligence. They are in discussion with those companies on a daily basis. And if they feel the need, for example, Vertex with CRISPR Therapeutics, if they feel a need to invest in those programs, be in with CRISPR, I mean, they're obviously think, doing something right, or at least they're doing something that we should prob probably be studying, right? Same thing with another CRISPR company called Intelia Therapeutics. Um, they got partnerships with Regeneron, with Novartis, which are big pharma companies. Right. You're looking at Pfizer, which invested in another B, uh, CRISPR company called Beam Therapeutics. I mean, why would Pfizer invest in these programs? Um, you know, everybody knows Pfizer. I mean, why would they invest in these in these programs? It's because they obviously see something, right? So that's that's my take on that. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about the CRISPR patent lawsuit and Caribou being involved? Any update on that? Well, actually, every CRISPR company is pretty much involved. Um, and I would actually uh, recommend folks if you if they're interested in the CRISPR story, just like the history, and because in order to understand the patent situation, you you must understand the history, right? Um, there's actually the book from uh, Walter Isaacson, which obviously everybody knows now from the Elon Musk book, but I actually read his Da Vinci book. He's an amazing author. Um, and he actually wrote a book in 2020 um, on CRISPR um, and, of course, on the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Dr. Jennifer Doudna, which we'll get into it shortly. But uh, basically, he talks about the patent situation and so on in that book. Um, there's a lot of history there. And basically, in a nutshell, uh, you have the East and West, right? In the U.S., you have MIT. Uh, and basically you have the broad Institute, which is the organization there. Um, and then you have the West side in California, you have, uh, what is it? The Berkeley, uh, university and some others, uh, they have their own organization, which is actually part of, uh, da Dr. Downa side of things. And basically there's a whole confusion as to, can we basically, cause you gotta remember that, right? Patents. I mean, everybody knows about patents and, um, ja ja um, in 2013, there was um, Dr. Zhang, who's actually one of the folks from the Broad Institute from the East. Of uh, so again, it's the East versus West, right? Th think of it that, those terms. And Dr. Zhang basically was the first ever to basically submit a paper on the fact that you could use CRISPR on a human cell. Mm. He was the first ever one to do that. And because he was the first ever one to do that, he obviously they were able to get obviously the patent for it and so on. And then obviously the West, they have their own version of the patent. It's been going for years. This is not stopping anytime soon. Actually, the last ruling actually favored the East, which is Dr. Zhang's team and brought in the Broad Institute basically. Um, but there's no conclusion on that my understanding i'll be honest it's it's a very complex topic even i don't fully understand it um but from my understanding anyways so far and i've had conversation off the record with some folks in the industry actually um they told me that basically it's just gonna play out it's just gonna go on for years this is not gonna be stopping anytime soon look crispr cas9 just got their fda their program fda approved right and they're still in the middle of the patent situation. And like I said, it's been going for years. If the FDA found reason to block that program because of it, they would have done it, but they didn't. So that's the way I see it. It is a legitimate topic because, you know, when you think patent, uh, um, especially in the technology world, world, you know, you're thinking you can't really use it, but clearly companies are using it regardless of what the patent situation is. So um, every company is involved in a sense, right? Um, how do you do you think that uh, I know you mentioned Pfizer and companies like that. Do you think at all that big pharma is scared of these technological uh, advancements in disrupting their overarching business models? Because if you cure a disease, you kind of don't need to sell drugs for the disease. Or do you think they see these technologies as um, adaptive forces that they can work with to increase their own revenues as well? I think I think it's the latter. I think it's the latter. I, I don't think they're looking at that from the lens of, oh, a CRISPR one day will eliminate our pills because it will just FYI, it will like, for example, heart diseases, like, you know, really, you, you think it'll, it'll be, a, there won't be a need for certain pills. If 
I right. mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not saying, like I said, CRISPR is a tool, right? So it's not like, I, I said that earlier, right? It's not like CRISPR will solve every single problem. It won't. It's just one tool, right? There'll still be pills. There'll still be different therapies and so on, different technologies. There's other companies in the genomic space working some other ways, like Sana Biotechnology, another company um, that doesn't really use CRISPR. Um, they have their own technology. They're doing something really well on their end with CAR T cells, which are basically for cancer. Um, uh, so basically what I'm getting at is I don't think CRISPR is going to like obviously eliminate all of that, uh, but it's definitely going to be a huge revenue generator for these companies, these big pharma companies. I mean, Vertex has been in this space for years and they said it themselves. Like it, they're quite bullish on, on CRISPR. Uh, Pfizer invested in Beam uh, program in early 2022. Um, you look at Pfizer buying 8% of stake in Caribou in 2023. Uh, you look at uh, other companies in this space, Regeneron, Novartis. I mean, there's so many other companies. Uh, the only one who I was a little bit disappointed was Moderna, who sort of invested in some random CRISPR company that's not even public. Um, that was the only weird move. From a big pharma company, but at least they invested in CRISPR. So, I think I think you, honestly, you think so, like yeah. something like heart disease can be replaced, but the the uh, but in general, Pfizer, Moderna, these guys are going to get value from CRISPR versus replaced. Absolutely, absolutely, they're going to get value for sure, for sure. Because I think there's going to be a huge market for it. Because uh, you, you got to remember, right? It's not just about like if we just stick on the heart disease side, which by by the way, CRISPR Therapeutics actually has a program for it as well. Um, Obviously, there's other pure plays of heart disease. Only heart disease with CRISPR is, for example, Verve Therapeutics, another company in the space. Um, their idea is, okay, we, they will obviously, their their initial idea is to cure heart diseases. But the next phase of that is to prevent them. Right. Right. Think about this, right? Think, Just try to think this through, right? What if you could just do one-time treatment and now you're basically potentially cured from any future heart disease. Would you mm. take that? I think I would. I would yeah. if, if obviously if it's proven and everything it's approved, for example, in the FDA. I mean, people did that in the pandemic, right? I mean, without going too political here, but they took something that was promised to them, right? Right. Um, and those companies made billions. And yeah. this is something else, right? That we're, we're talking like, you know, I'm sure you know people around you who've had heart disease, um, so think about that, right? Like, like this is this is what I like. I, I want people to the biggest takeaway is CRISPR. What it does, it, it extends your lifespan, because it does. It, let, let, let's say you were supposed to die at 80 years old because of a heart attack. Well, what if we prevent that? Hmm. So maybe now you die at what 85, 90? That extended your lifespan. You know what I mean? Do, do, do you think that we are in the, the time period where technology and uh, AI, which I want to touch on just a little bit, is advancing to the point where in our lifetime, so you and me, I think, are in our late 20s, getting to 30. In our lifetime, do you think we could get extended to that 100 years average? Right now, I think it's 74 in the United States on average for a man. Or do you think our kids' kids are going to get the real benefits of the technology that will lead them to be 120, 130 years old? Uh, actually, I, I actually think it's our generation. Um, actually, I'm in my early 30s, uh, by the way. <laughs> I'm in my 20s. Uh, but but uh, I definitely think our generation, because you, 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 I think people are sort of, uh, for sure, long term is important, right? You, you got to think long term. You got to look at this in 10, 20 years. Uh, but there's a domino effect, right? There's an exp exponential growth, right? It's like the S stick of, I'm sure the S-curve that people have studied for technologies in different industries, right? At the beginning, it's slow. It's slow. It takes time. It takes years. There's lots of naysayers. It's like there's lots of fog and everything. But then you hit an inflection point where things start just growing really, really fast, right? right. More adoption. You get funding. You get these companies that come out of nowhere. You get these uh, partnerships that are built. You get the FDA that approves several programs. And then fast forward, what you have now is a bunch of CRISPR therapies that are able to tackle certain diseases, that are able to basically prevent certain diseases. Look at your basically with, again, CRISPR is one tool. You got to look at genomics as a whole. There's a bunch of things going on, right? Um, 
using different technologies to basically help you extend your lifespan. Do I think it's going to hit 100 plus years in our life lifespan? Uh, you know, it's it's a bit hard to predict that because, you know, think about it. We still have like 80, 60, 70, 80 years to go there right. um, to, you know, come to a conclusion for that. But um, I, I actually think... I actually think it will happen in our lifetime. If it's not in our lifetime, for sure in our children's lifetime. Otherwise, something went wrong. I think something went wrong with the CRISPR. Um, and and there are a lot of ethics issues, right? Don't get me wrong. It's it's without going into a whole new topic here. Just I, I do want to recognize there are morals and ethics issues behind it. That's why there was a documentary um, on HBO. Well, let's, let's actually let's actually talk about that for a minute because that yeah. was one of the segments I wanted to have. And let's 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 discuss that in terms of. Um, the idea of playing God, which is, I think, functionally what this is, it, it, from your personal perspective, and then also how do you think people see it in the industry, the idea that we can extend lifespan, the idea that we can genetically modify genes in a certain way to pick if you want a boy or a girl, which I actually have a friend who he did in vitro fertilization with his wife, and they picked, they wanted a boy because he was getting old. He's like, I didn't want to worry about you know if it was a boy or girl, and they, they made it happen. Is that something that ethically as a society you think we should really care about or just naturally we are getting to the point where, you know, those decisions are important for people to at least have a chance to make? Yeah, that's that's a, like I, I want a couple of things. Right. First of all, uh, Dr. Davna, which, again, uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, the big person in this space that everybody really knows, she actually spends her daily like on a daily basis at this point talking to organizations around the world about the morals and ethics of CRISPR. Like, even though she was basically one of the founders of this technology in a sense, right? Not really, but in a sense, um, she's actually spending more time talking about the morals and ethics. So it is a big thing, right? Around the world, people are like, well, or should we be playing God and so on? I want to, like, a couple of facts, right? I think sometimes people get too much in the weeds and they forget about the big picture. I mean, antibiotics. Right. And like we involved antibiotics years ago and without antibiotics, there are some people that would basically die from, you know, yeah. we That's basically true. have antibiotics that cure people and extend their lifespan. So it's not like CRISPR is just introducing that topic in humanity. It doesn't. It's always been here. Like the idea of extending lifespan. We've always done it. Right. That's the whole point of technology. Like the whole point of technology is to live a better life. And potentially a longer one, more healthier one. Please. Right. And right. that's what technology has always done, right? We've always evolved over humanity. You look at all these technologies that I mentioned at the beginning there, the printer, the light bulb, you know, the cars, airplanes, saves you time so that you can live a better life, right? So you don't have to travel, you know, three days to get to another city. You can travel in three hours, right? So the, my point here is that, the ethics are definitely important, and I think playing God and so on, I think it gets re a heated debate when people start talking about designer babies, which is yeah. basically what you're getting at, which is I want my kid to be six feet five because I want him to play in the NBA, and I want him, um, you know, blue eyes because, you know, we don't want brown eyes. First of all, I, I, I want to iterate a couple of things. These are complex things. Like, it's not like your rare disease where sickle cell disease, you have this mutation that happened in the gene and you know how to fix it or where to fix it at least changing your eye color without any replication and so on that's a whole new like i think that's gonna take like 15 20 years of research to be honest i don't even think right. we're there anywhere close to that right so let's let's mention that first second um i actually don't i'm not i'm not i, I don't know if it's uh, me being naive i, I just don't think this is going to happen anytime soon. And um, my focus is really more on the human therapeutic side of things and making sure that we actually cure folks from certain diseases, help communities, families around the world. Um, and and I, I, I want to iterate one more point. Um, I think the big moral and ethics question that down, Dr. Downla, for example, going is going around with is should we modify the germline of someone, for example, of sickle cell disease, because if we now have a cure for it, we cure that person from it. Should we not edit their germline so that their children don't have sickle cell disease? I think that's a big question, right? When you start editing germline um, in China, unfortunately, a couple of uh, years ago in China, there was a scientist who actually 
attempted to do that uh, with HIV. So they he, he actually did it. Like he actually went through the experiment, uh, and the Chinese government imprisoned the person. Um, and that was the first time ever that the moral slash ethics question of the CRISPR world really became a hot topic. And ever since, um, I think that's the big, big question, right? Should we edit germ lines? Um, now, now, I know some folks who, you know, watch science, science is like as a scientific, uh, what is it, the Hollywood movies and so on that, they, um, you know, we, we, we're not there yet, like editing babies and so on. We're, we're not there. Yet. We're way far from that. Could it happen one day? Of course. Right. Um, but just like every great technology, it could be used for the greater cause of huma humans, or it could be, unfortunately, used as a weapon. Right. No, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot, and I think I think that ethical part of the discussion is very important because I think a lot of times people, you know, are curious about it, but um, understanding the the extent to which technology is evolving and when it's going to happen is is the key components to it. Can you talk a little bit about AI and what you feel AI is doing to accelerate the ability for CRISPR to become more rampant? Yeah, so uh, actually, if I recall, um, I think it was Beam Therapeutic CEO or maybe CRISPR Therapeutic CEO, one of those two companies, in one of the ent interviews, uh, they mentioned that uh, on top of obviously the clinical trials and everything, they're actually working on manufacturing facilities get, get that can leverage um, latest technologies that can leverage AI to make it more efficient. Uh, and these manufacturing plants are important for some of these therapies, right? Uh, we haven't really talked about the exact process, how the therapy actually works, but uh, basically you have to extract the cell. For example, therapeutics program, you have to extract the cell uh, from the body, do some edits, then basically re-inject back it into the body. That's really high level, I'm, I'm explaining. But the idea of extracting them, putting it some medical facility, doing some work on it, um, that's what we're talking about, manufacturing facility. Um, there's some AI going on there. Um, there are other companies too, like Ginkgo Bioworks, doing some good work. Um, there's actually Palantir too, Palantir. I know you're a huge fan of Palantir, but uh, Palantir, they announced a couple of, I think it was two years ago or something, uh, or maybe more, um, that they were doing some work with some genomics companies, leveraging AI and so on. I didn't fully understand exactly what exactly they were doing, but I know there, uh, I, I, I do want to iterate the fact that CRISPR is one tool in the toolkit. There are other technologies that we need to evolve. We need there uh, in order to get to that, you know, quote unquote dream of curing a bunch of diseases and preventing people from diseases and pot potentially extending lifespan to, like you said, 100 plus. Uh, so I think AI, AI has, a, has a role for sure. It has a role, um, but it's a bit too early, in my opinion, uh, to start you know, s stating how AI could impact the industry. I think in my opinion, anyways, I think it's early. Yeah. The way I understand AI in the context of this space is just large amounts of data. It tries to consolidate all that data and then try to make sense of it to, to some extent, to be able to find patterns, drug discovery, things of that nature. Uh, but obviously there's a ton more that goes into AI meaningfully playing a role in, in CRISPR. Can you tell me a little bit about Ginkgo Bioworks? Any thoughts on that company? Uh, Kathy Wood, has like 200 million shares of it. Why do you think people are excited about that one? Yeah, I, I this was uh, back in 2021. I remember listening to the podcast of the uh, uh, CEO and founder of uh, Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, what's his name? I think it's Jason, Jason Kelly. Kelly, yeah, Jason Kelly. Um, he actually responded to me on x.com once. Um, anyways, um, well, Elon Musk also responded to me twice by the way really um, that's cool yeah, yeah he did, he did. You only liked uh, my tweet once so you got a response actually no he liked it twice and he liked uh, sorry he liked it once and he responded to me twice anyways the point here is that i was listening to uh, J uh kelly's uh, interview and this was about the time when ginkgo was going public actually um and i think what he was saying it, it's a it's an interesting idea i just don't know how you know sometimes you got to be careful to taking what these people are talking about because they're obviously they have invested interest, right? Talking about their company, the mission, talking about the big idea. I think it's good to listen to those interviews and to make your own conviction, build your own conviction and your research. Uh, but uh, Kelly said something like, um, "In the history of human, we've we've sort of moved information from bits to bits, right? So internet mm -hmm. is bits to bits, right? You you know talk about all the software companies and all, it's all bits to bits. We've never been able to move atoms to atoms." 
And I think that's what his company really is focusing on. It's the idea of creating this world where you have no restriction on what you want to make, what you want to have. It's like they have this really nice image that they usually use for their marketing slides. Uh, it's like you have like dinosaurs out there. You have like big plants. You have like this beautiful world. And obviously what, what the image is saying is that there's no climate change issues. Uh, everybody's hip ha living happy. Um, you can use synthetic biology to create weed. You know, you don't have to grow it, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, weed, yeah, for sure. If you want to, yeah, actually, yeah, they're, they, they're partnered with some weed companies, you're right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's their idea. My thoughts on, on that, uh, I, again, I, I, I'm more focused on the CRISPR side of things. I know this is more of a genomics thing as a whole. Um, I think, I think, I, in my opinion, I think we're too early for something like this. I, I still think we're too early. I think there's space for it. I think there's a lot. For, you got to you got to remember they went public when the biotech market was almost at its peak, um, and things have been gone down. I mean, for most companies, things have gone down um, ever since, um, or at least stabilized now. So they went public around that time, and there was a lot of hype for it. Uh, I know there was the, this uh, shorts report from Scorpion. I think it was that threw them off in October 2021, if I remember. Um, but yeah, I think we're too early for this technology. I'll be honest with you. Like, I'm, and it's crazy because I'm saying that coming from someone who's all in for CRISPR, right? And people said CRISPR is way too early. Back in last year, people actually, if you believe it or not, people were saying that the FDA was going to reject that program, right? So. You know, maybe, people, maybe, you know, maybe I have my opinion on Ginkgo is probably the same thing. You know, maybe they're doing something amazing and I just don't see it. So, but it's too early and yeah, that's my, my opinion. Okay. Let's talk about, um, and this will be like the, basically the last thing, the ARC genomics fund. So I'm looking at it right here. She's got 2 million shares of exact sciences, 1.8 million of CRISPR, 3 million of twist. And then it just keeps going on and on and on Ginkgo vertex. A lot of the companies you talked about today. Um, as an investor, do you think it makes sense? Because in this world, I don't know what valuation means. Obviously you can come to a valuation that all those traditional metrics are there, but if it works, it works. And like, you know, valuation maybe is not the biggest concern. Do you kind of think just buy arc G and obviously not financial advice, but if, if I'm just genuinely interested, I want some exposure, maybe arc G is the best way to get it. Or should I actually do financial analysis on CRISPR, on Ginkgo, on Vertex to come to a conclusion on which ones to buy? Yeah, I mean, RG is, a, is a definitely a, a great fund for genomics. I mean, you got to give uh, credits where it's due. I mean, ARK Invest were one of the first institutions out there to support CRISPR. Um, and not just CRISPR. Some of those companies you, li uh, you, you were looking at, uh, Teladoc uh, and so on, they were some of the first early companies to support those companies. So uh, the genomics fund, I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't have any shares of that genomics fund, and I never have. Why? Um, well, because I, I, there's some companies in there that I just don't fully. I mean, look, there's some companies that in there, and again, I don't want to start, um, you know, throwing those names out. But there's some companies I just don't believe in, and I don't really have a high conviction. Um, and they made some decisions. If you track their trades, especially in 2022, 2023, RG fund, they made some decisions that were a little bit weird, like. Uh, buying more of DNA, Ginkgo Bioworks, while selling some of the winners, and I understand, you know, you, you know, they gotta rebalance their portfolio and so on. But it's just, I'm not. I'm, there, there's certain things they've done with the fund that I'm not fully supportive of. Right. Um, that's probably why I haven't done it about any of those. Uh, but I do want to mention that uh, again, they were one of the early folks to talk about genomics as a whole. Uh, actually, I learned a lot from their articles, from their podcast episodes, especially the podcast episode with uh, Dr. Liu, who's actually another player in the CRISPR landscape. Um, so th they've done a great work in the CRISPR world. They've done great work in the genomics world as a whole. Um, but my thoughts remain the same. I just think they're if if you're not interested in CRISPR specifically, if you just want a broad, like a basket of companies in the genomics um, space. In my opinion, they're probably the best fund for it. Um, and like I said, uh, they're quite tuned in with those companies. Um, just my own preference is I prefer to stick with CRISPR companies. And um, and if I wanted to invest in any of those companies individually, I would just do that. All right. 
This was awesome. Uh, Hassan's YouTube and Twitter is in the description right now. Thank you so much, Hassan, for being on the channel. I definitely have a lot of research to do in this space because it is incredibly exciting. It just is one of those things that if you're doing the research, realize that research might play out you know, a decade from now. Uh, but it could be one of the most exciting things that does play out because at the end of the day, it's about extending your life. And I think all of us kind of care about that, you know? That's it for us. Thank you for being here. Hassan's YouTube and Twitter's in the description. Thanks for being on, Hassan, and we'll have you on again. Thank you very much, Amit. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.